Exactly. I believe it. I believe it. Thank God. Oh, it has. Well, I, 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 I'm just uh, amazed. <laughs> just amazed at God and all of His wonders. Um, I, w I, I do want to. I do have a couple of announcements uh, before I get started on the Word today. Um, next month. Uh, Amanda Anderson, who is the uh, women's pastor at the church here at Christ Worship Center, will be our speaker, and we're really excited about her coming. So uh, invite a friend, um, have somebody come with you, and let's see what the Lord will do. Um, but um, I wanted to tell you, uh, I've got some reading to do from a prophecy, so I hope that you'll enjoy what I believe the Lord has given me for this particular time and these particular people. Um, I've heard it said, and I believe this so strongly, I believe I'm in the right place at the right time mm -hmm. with the right people today. Amen. But on a Thursday morning in July, the first conscious thought that I had as I was waking up was, they shall run and not grow weary. And when those words came to me, I immediately got up and went to my desk, and I looked up that very familiar scripture in Isaiah 40, 31. But those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Now commentaries say that Isaiah was great for two reasons. He lived in uh, momentous days, uh, in critical days of international upheaval. And he wrote what many consider the greatest book of the Old Testament. Another uh, commentary uh, said, We see Isaiah move with fearless dignity through the chaos of his day, firm in his quiet faith, but sure in his God. Amen. I believe that's what God's calling us to do. Because we also live in uh, momentous days. We live in a crucial time for our nation. And I believe that God is calling us to, uh, through the chaos of the day, through the chaos of the government, through everything that's going on in our nation today, <coughs> I believe he is calling us to move with fearless dignity Amen. through the chaos of the day, to be firm in our faith and to be sure of our God. Uh, at the time uh, when the empires were rising and falling and uh, Isaiah's nation was in peril, he wrote, In returning and rest you shall be saved. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength. Yes. There is strength in confidence. And that confidence comes by the power of the Holy Ghost. That's why it's so important that if you're not baptized in the Holy Ghost, that you get baptized mm -hmm. in the Holy Amen. Ghost. Know who your God is and obtain that confidence that is necessary to strengthen your life. Um, and when a new generation faced the task of rebuilding a ruined nation, uh, it was the words of Isaiah the prophet that gave them courage. But those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Now in the time leading up to chapter 40 of the book of Isaiah, the people of God had endured 16 years of political leadership that had led them in the wrong direction. King Ahaz uh, must have been, uh, must have at some point professed faith in God because he was, after all, the king of Judah. Uh, but when you look at his life, you see a very different picture because he promoted uh, things that would, that was not, um, that would not honor the Holy One of Israel. In fact, that was Isaiah's favorite thing to call God. That was his favorite name for God, the Holy One of Israel. But King Ahaz did not promote um, the fact that human life was sacred. In fact, it was under him that the abominable act of um, sacrificing children in the fire, the, uh, the taking of infants is offensive to God. It was offensive in King Ahaz's day, and it's offensive now. Amen. But this uh, this led to the judgment of God that was com coming upon the nation. 
and uh, King Ahaz was also responsible for attempting to restructure the practice of faith in the nation. He wanted to water down the faith of the nation so that it would fit the cultural trends of the day. Sounds a bit familiar, does it not? The major influence from Assyria uh, was a growing superpower uh, to the north, and uh, for some reason or other, it was very attractive to King Ahaz, and uh, he wanted to obtain their favor. And so he admired their religion, and he even uh, took measurements of their altar and uh, so that he could produce the exact replica in the temple in Jerusalem. That, um, I, I think we see some of this. You know, the enemy really is not very creative. It seems as though he tries the tr same tricks over and over and over because we see some of this in our own nation. We see that uh, there is a, uh, uh, a decay in the church or, or uh, the, the, the people that are not standing up but I believe God is having a revival among the yeah. church people. I do. Uh -huh. And I believe the church is going to rise to the occasion. And I don't believe that. I, I believe that people are tired of a watered down gospel. Hey, I think they're tired of, of uh, fitting into cultural trends. I think the people, and I believe the church, is ready for a move of God. I believe we're ready for signs, wonders, and miracles to be, for, to, to be performed in our church. I, I, don't, I think religion is. Um, is something that people are wanting to get away from. They want to feel a, a true move of God. Amen. And so I'm thankful for that. But this went on for 16 long years. In 2 Kings 16 and 2, the Lord tells us that uh, he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And there must have been a great sense of relief when uh, his uh, kingdom was over and they were bringing in a new kingdom. I'm sure that the people... Uh, had prayed for the restoration of righteousness in their nation just as we're doing today. And I'm sure they prayed for policies that would protect human life just as we're doing today. And I'm sure they prayed uh, that God's name would be honored in their nation just as we've done here today. Um, and they must have uh, had great expectation and hope when they heard that King Hezekiah was going to be their new king. And Hezekiah was a good king. In fact, 2 Kings 18, 5 through 6 says, He trusted in the Lord of Is the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor uh, before him. That's a pretty good testimony, isn't it? Uh, for he held fast to the Lord. He did um, not uh, he did not depart from following him, but he kept his commandments which the Lord had commanded Moses, and the Lord was with him, and he prospered him wherever he went. Um, and so at last, there had uh, the nation had godly leadership. Uh, but as we follow the story, even best leaders are faced with great problems. That's why we, as the church, have a responsibility and a mandate to pray for our leaders. Even if they're a great leader, we cannot lead our country and their leadership to chance. We have to pray for our leaders and for the nation. And I'm so thankful that uh, we institute, Sheila instituted this at a GLOW last year, or maybe two years ago, actually, um, that we prayed for our country. Uh, first Timothy 2, 1 and 3 says, Therefore I exhort first of all that supplication, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, who are in authority, that we may live a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and reverence, for this is good um, and acceptable in the sight of God. And so Hezekiah faced some problems, just as we are facing some problems. And so that's why it's so important for us to pray that in Hezekiah's day, there was an overpowering enemy. The power of Assyria uh, was just growing. And... Uh, the most aggressive uh, Assyrian leader was Sennacherib, and under his leadership, the northern part of Israel was invaded and devastated. The people were scattered, 
And uh, this meant that the growing power of Syria was coming right up to the very edge of this tiny uh, remaining state, the, the two tribes of Judah around the city of Jerusalem. And I want to read a prophecy from Jane Hannon that was released, released earlier this year. As a woman gives birth in the ninth month, so will the church begin to birth the breakthroughs we have been carrying, releasing uh, a time of fulfill, uh, fruitfulness, blessing, joy, fulfillment, and harvest. A pregnant woman is said to be expecting. I hear the challenge of the Holy Spirit as he asks us, what are you expecting? What must uh, move past, uh, we must move past weariness, disappointment, and fears regarding past seasons of barrenness and or spiritual stillbirth and stir up a revival of our expectations before God in order to see our faith produce the breakthroughs we've been carrying. Last year, about this time, the Lord spoke to Sheila and said, do not abort. And she was, he was speaking of this particular lighthouse. And uh, I know that during that time there was great weariness, but God wants to bring forth a revival, and he is going to bring it forth through. I, I think we're going to be part of it. I, I, I know that there's not many people here today, but I believe this is going to be a part of the revival that's going to be taking place. Uh, as a woman completes her ninth month, her discomfort increases until delivery. Sometimes she even feels miserable with emotions, sleepless nights, and pressure. But there is a joy set before her. That joy will give grace to endure the times of challenge, knowing that when it becomes time to push, your life will change forever. Isaiah 37 and 3, Hezekiah declared, For the children are come to birth, and there is no strength to bring forth. The prophecy was given to King Hezekiah, a righteous king who was a reformer, turning Ju uh, Judah back to God and restoring temple worship. He was faithful to the Lord, yet his city, Jerusalem, was uh, had become uh, besieged by this cruel king of uh, Assyria, Sennacherib, and was faced with certain destruction if God didn't interfere. They were vulnerable under the reign of Hezekiah, and he tried to negotiate uh, and in the end, he was managed. He managed to bring a temporary reprieve, but it cost the kingdom of God, uh, the temple there. It cost quite a bit because um, he had to hand over to the king of Assyria all of the silver that was in the temple, the gold, and even the uh, gold that was on the door and the door uh, and the doorpost from the house of God. Um, now I believe that. God has given us great things in the church, and if we could sort of liken them to uh, the silver and the gold and all of the things that was in the temple in a, in, in a physical sense, but I believe that the Lord has given us silver and gold and precious uh, things in the spirit that uh, that that is going to help us propel the move of God in these last days. And they're ancient things like um, uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the joy of the Lord is our strength. That's gold and that's silver. Every promise that God has given us uh, is part of, of what the fixtures of our spiritual house is. And the enemy wants to take those from us. He wants to besiege us, and he wants to, us to give him our joy. He wants us to give him our faith. He wants us to give him the power of the Holy Ghost. He wants us to give him the freedom, but we're not going to do that. Amen? Uh, those, uh, and I believe God is restoring that to us. So uh, in this particular story, um, he had to give all of that away, Everything, all the things that, that, that David had put in the temple of the Lord that were sacred and that was holy, he handed them over to this, to this king. And so now we'll read again from Jane Hannon's um, prophecy. 
uh, Sennacherib's emissary, his mouthpiece, Rabbishek, was sent to demoralize Hezekiah. Now, I believe the enemy uh, has sent some voices, mm -hmm. uh, mouthpieces, in these last days <clears throat> to demoralize and to keep us from uh, hearing and acting upon the word of the Lord. But he sent Rabshak to uh, uh, demoralize Hezekiah and his armies. He was trying to get them to give up. He was trying to wear them down. He was uh, getting them to, wanting them to lay down their weapons and to surrender the city. He tried to convince Hezekiah and his leaders that God had forsaken them and that he would not save them. Have you ever been in a situation like that where you just almost felt forsaken? Amen. Well, uh, that's what that's what that's the voice of the enemy. Uh, he his name uh, means chief prince, and they dwell in demonic assignments against true reformers and leaders today. Rabshak filled the air with his accusations against who God is, against mm -hmm. who the leaders are, mm -hmm. and about the impossibility of their situation. Understanding, he was seeking to spread poison and to get their to get in their heads so that they would be beaten down, so that he would weary them and he would submit uh, them to giving up and to being overthrown. Don't let the enemy get in your head. He will convince you that all the works of righteousness and reformation has uh, is is brought to nothing. And it's been for nothing. Everything that you've uh, done, all the years that you've lived for the, for the Lord, the enemy wants to tell you that it's all for nothing. But don't let the enemy get in your head. And um, that in, uh, he, he'll try to tell you, the enemy will try to tell you that in the end, God will abandon you and not hear your prayers. Is it possible to be pregnant with reformation and not bring it forth? Is it possible to be pregnant with your miracle answered and it be aborted or stillborn, still, stillborn because you've given up? Rather than let Rabshak and his poisonous words rob them of their land, this is what Hezekiah did. He set himself to seek the Lord and to pray. He encouraged his people with these faith-filled words in the midst of a desperate time. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid nor dismayed before the king of Assyria, nor for all the multitude that is with him. For there is more with us than be with him. With him is the arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God Amen. to help us and to fight our battles. And the people rested themselves upon the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. And he also sent for Isaiah the prophet to get a word from God for them. You know, you need a prophet in your life. You need someone speaking truth and word in your life. And if you don't have someone like that, you need to pray that God would open a door for him to uh, bring someone into your life to speak the word of God to you. Um, he would, um, so he brought uh, Isaiah in. And Isaiah came in and told Hezekiah the Lord had heard his prayers. He would defend the city. He, was re, uh, he, he then released a prophetic word to break uh, through that sounded impossible. And this is what happened. That night, God sent an angel down, and uh, he wiped out 185,000 Assyrians and Rabshak and um, Sennacherib both returned to their own country only to be killed by one of their own. God fought for Judah that day. Mm -hmm. Prayer and prophecy shifted the battle and brought heavenly intervention, which I believe is what's happened here today. today. I believe it happened right here in this room today. That's right. I believe, I believe the prayers and the prophecies that has gone forth today has shifted and the battle and has brought heavenly intervention. The prophet's reward, reward was manifested and God mobilized the angel armies to overthrow the enemy. And it's about this situation that Isaiah prophesied, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Every tongue that rises against you in judgment, 
you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and the righteousness of me is of me, says the Lord. Amen. Amen. And then the other thing that happened in um, in this story is uh, uh, the king of Babylon at that time was not a very significant power in the area, but still the king of Babylon he he, he hears about Hezekiah because Hezekiah had been very ill and. Uh, he turned his uh, space to pray to the Lord, and the Lord gave him 15 more years. And so uh, the king of Babylon hears about that, and he sends messengers with letters and gifts to King Hezekiah. And it sounds like a really nice thing to do, but in Isaiah 39, it tells us what really happens. Uh, at, the, at that time, the son of uh, Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he had heard that he had been sick and that he had recovered. <clears throat> and that sounds like a wonderful thing to do, and Hezekiah was so happy to see them. And he brought them in, and he receives them with gladness, and he brings them into his kingdom, and he shows them his storehouses. And not only had Hezekiah recovered, but no doubt his land had also been restored and the economy had recovered and he was happy to tell about the blessings of his nation and so he shows these messengers he shows them everything the silver the gold the spices the fine oils he shows them his army and everything in in his kingdom all of his treasures he shows them and there was nothing in the palace nor in the kingdom that he did not show to the messengers from Babylon. And this proved a desperate mistake for him because Isaiah tells the king, he says, I believe you've just lit a slow burning fire. And um, he had opened up the treasures to what he thought were, was a friend. But in fact, these were actually enemies and they were there on a mission to see exactly what they had. So what I'm saying to you is, sure, we need to testify. Sure, we need to prophesy. But the things that God has given us, the, the treasures that's within us that he's placed in these earthen vessels, do not give them away and do not expose them to the enemy because the enemy will take advantage. If he gets an opportunity for a, a toehold, he will take advantage. And so we need to guard with all diligence the treasures that God has deposited on the inside of us. And so uh, we see that what happens is that they are plundered by Babylon. And they are, all of their treasures are taken away. And their goodly uh, men the, their young men and their, um, uh, their strong men, they're all taken in captivity, and the only thing is left are those that really um, had nothing to offer the kingdom of Babylon after they uh, ruined the city and burned the city. They just leave those to fend for themselves. You know, the enemy has no, he has no conscience, and he doesn't care if you're strong or if you're weak, he will take advantage of you at any possible situation. And so that brings us to chapter 40, which is where we wanted to get to all along and which is where we started. Uh, and in the chapter 40 of Isaiah, uh, no prophet has written with such majestic eloquence about the glory of God. And in verse one, he says, Comfort, yes, comfort my people. And this was addressed originally to a weary and a discouraged Jewish exile, exiles who were returning to an impoverished land. They were returning to a ruined temple. But this chapter has brought comfort and hope to God's people in every age and in every kind of difficult situation. The lost, the prodigal, the brokenhearted, the ones struggling uh, through... Uh, through doubt and unbelief, the ones desperate for a miracle, the revolutionary and the reformer and the weary. The same verse is still true today. 
Um, and Isaiah ends the chapter with this, uh, the famous verse that we've already talked about. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. So the question is, how do you get after uh, everything that's happened in your life? How do you get from verse 1, comfort, yes, comfort my people, to the strength to birth a revival and a reformation in our nation that Jane Hammond spoke about in her prophecy. How do we get from that point to soar like eagles and to run and not be weary and to walk and not faint? Well, the Hebrew word translated comfort also means to repent. God brings comfort not to rebellious people, but he brings it to repentant people. And he spoke to the returning exiles uh, just like he's speaking to us today, comfort, yes, comfort my people, repent. If you're in a survival mode, repent, pray, and prophesy. If you feel besieged, repent, pray, and prophesy. If you need a miracle that looks impossible, repent, pray, and prophesy. If you are carrying a reformation and a revival on the inside of you, repent and release the voice of God that will shatter your enemy and bring both revival and reformation in your life, in those around you, and also in our nation. Amen. But they that wait, and then after we've done that, after we've repent and we've prayed and we've prophesied and we, we're bringing forth, then we wait. We wait upon the Lord. The figurative meaning of wait means to wait, to hope, to expect, and to convey anticipation. But the literal meaning of the word wait means to bind together like a cord. It is the binding and the twisting of strands uh, until they become a strong rope. Ecclesiastes says in 4 and 12, a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. A rope can lift hundreds of pounds. An individual strand would snap under the weight of it. Uh, it can lift 100 pounds, and it can pull a load. And as it stretches, the fibers and the strands of the rope are pulled closer together, and the ropes is what gives our life strength. The ropes of our lives are made stronger because we have bound ourselves to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. And not the will, it's not the will of the Father, um, I'm so sorry, uh, of the Holy Ghost. Uh, the will of the Father has been woven into our lives whenever we bind ourselves together with him. The strength that we have is not our own, but it's the strength that we have in him when we bind ourselves to him and to his word. And then we'll have the strength to walk and not faint. Um, he, he asked this question in the, um, I think the 28th verse, it, or the 29th verse. He says, have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither fails nor is weary. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint, will faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. When you cannot humanly overcome a situation, God's power is perfected on your behalf. Mm -hmm. When human strength ends, the power of God excels because we have chosen to wait on the Lord, because we have chosen to weave our lives and to bind ourselves to the word of God. Amen. Because Amen. I have chosen to wait. I bind myself to God and his word. And because of that, I will not grow weary. But I'll run. Amen. I'll, I'll not be I'll not weary. Fight. And I'll not faint. And I'll, zo I'll soar with the eagles. Amen. Oh, so I, I, hope that, I hope that that blesses you today. Um, uh, I it, it did me to know um, that I don't have to rely on my own strength. There is a power mm -hmm. at the very core of my being mm -hmm. that propels me to do 
the will and the work of God. Right? Amen. 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 So um, uh, we'll, uh, if anyone else would like prayer, we're open to do that. But um, if not, we'll just pray and we'll be released. If anybody has anything to say, we're, we're open to that. Amen. Or we'll pray. Father, we're just so thankful for everything that you've accomplished here today. Lord, I thank you for these women that have gathered in your name. God, to receive of your spirit and to learn of your word. And so, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would strengthen them, that you would bless them, oh God, that you would bind them together with your word. And God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would go before them, and God, that the glory of the Lord would be their rear guard, and we give you the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. Amen. Well, thank you for coming, and be sure to come come back next next time to hear Amanda Anderson. We're really excited about it. We'll probably be getting you something in the mail about it too.